The following program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory at Baltimore's Faithful. Well, good morning, people of God, and welcome to another glorious Lord's Day. And of course, Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory. That's because of you, and we're so grateful. Big shout out to all of the tremendous viewers who I run into from time to time who share with me how much this program has encouraged them, and in so doing, They've encouraged me. So I just want to say thank you and good morning to you. Listen, speaking of encouragement, we've got some encouragement of a special sort with our guest. Of course, we've got the spoken word with Bishop Dante Hickman coming up. But first and foremost, I want to introduce our guest. He is no stranger to me. This young man, uh, Minister Gordon Jones, used to work with us in radio years ago. Uh, but he's here in the capacity, new capacity, as an author. Gordon, how are you? Oh, blessed today. Yes, indeed. Author? Yes. Where did that come from? <laughs> Jack of all trades. <laughs> Jack of all trades. Okay. So, so uh, you decided to put together a book. What inspired you to do it? Well, the way things have been going on in life, people need positive information and they need to think in the right way. So that's what inspired me. So look, we're going to find out what kind of information you've got in your book. I like the title, Quotes Are Us. All right, thank you. It sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, speaking of familiar, let's make our way to a very familiar place, Southern Baptist Church, get our first spoken word from the very familiar Bishop Dante Hickman, right, right here on Grace and Glory. We'll be right back. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman, Sr. By the time of our text, the Apostle Paul wrote his, wrote his final words to the church at Rome while he was yet in Corinth. And in the finale of his writing, he offered recommendations and commendations to the church to help them to maintain their faith and their fellowship together, especially where there were churches filled with Jewish and Gentile Christians. From the outset of this chapter, he recommended that they receive Phoebe, who he called a deacon, and someone they should assist in whatever business or help she needed from them. Phoebe, had been a trusted servant of Paul and was probably the bearer of his teachings and his writings to the church at Rome. In my estimation, this was remarkable in and of itself in that in a time of gender inequality that Paul was emphasizing and embracing the exemplary leadership of women like Phoebe and Priscilla, who he names in this text, who had a business of tent making and a ministry partnership of a church with her husband, Aquila. Subsequently, the early church was not about tearing down social and sexual, or they were about tearing down social and sexual barriers and not erecting them to oppress and objectify certain groups of people. This is why it's completely erroneous and heretical to use the Bible and Christianity against its own principles of liberation and equality, to subjugate people based upon their color, culture, gender and sexuality, all to appease our own egotistical and economical needs and agendas. Simply put, love, not selfishness, is the ultimate aim of the church and of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul makes every effort to close his letter to the church at Rome with an abundance of clarity comprehensiveness and consistency that they would not allow themselves to be divided by their cultural, cultural and sexual distinctions. 
but to embrace their connectivity through their faith and fellowship in Jesus Christ. And the church today should be just as intentional about loving rather than hating. Should be intentional about lifting rather than lowering, covering than exposing, forgiving than judging, and cooperating rather than condemning of other people. Because if truth be told, destroying others only destroys you. Killing others only kills you. Rejecting others only rejects you. So Paul, throughout this chapter, encourages them to greet one another. Because no matter where you're from, we are all a part of each other through Jesus Christ. And what I like about Paul in this portion of his writing is that while he's telling them to greet one another, he starts naming the names of people and their significance to the ministry of Christ in Rome and beyond. He demonstrated that the ministry was not based and built upon all of the famous and popular people we know, but on people we have never heard of. Listen at him. I know you're not going to read it. Paul said to them to greet Epinatus, Andronicus, and Junia, Amplius, Urbanus, Stachus, Apelles, the household of Aristobulus, Herodian, the household of Narcissus, Traphina, and Traphosa, Persis, Rufus, and his mother in them. Asyncritus, Philegon, Hermas, Patrobos, Hermes, Philologos, and Julia. Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Somebody saying, go ahead, pastor, with them pronunciation. When you read it, you pronounce it your way. And yet, all we talk about is Peter, James, and John, and Paul. But the kingdom is more than the names you know. Can I tell you that this church, there are people you know because you see them up front, or you hear them leading songs. But the people that mobilize this church and are the engine for our effectiveness are names you have never heard. Because what makes the church and the kingdom great are all the unknown names that serve the only name that matters. And that name is Jesus Christ. And all of us should never strive to make our names greater than his name. Problem with the church and pastors and preachers and people is everybody wants to make their name great. And everybody is seeking fame on the back of Jesus. Seeking fame. Or have you sick, suicidal, and stressed out? But being faithful to what you were called to do and to what you have a passion for will give you peace and favor from God long after and whether or not anybody calls your name. So, so Paul closes this letter as strongly as he started, encouraging the church to be receptive and relational to one another. And he does so even to the point of telling them to greet each other 
with a holy kiss. Yeah. Now, the holy kiss was not to become a perverted way for sexual deviance in the church to stimulate and satisfy themselves. Some folk get mad when you don't say greet and hug one another because they've been waiting all week to cop their free freaky feel <laughs> with your nasty self. But when you come to church, you should be more spiritually minded than you are sexually minded. And if you keep your mind and your eyes on Christ, you won't be worried about what somebody else is wearing. Preach Dante. A holy kiss was a traditional sign of peace and a wish of blessing that is equivalent to a handshake or fist bump today. It was not something to be institutionalized and implemented in the church as a sign of our Christianity. But it does mean that we ought to at least speak to one another. Some of y'all came in church and ain't speak to nobody. Look at the person beside you and tell them, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And put a smile on your face. I didn't sleep with you last night. That's why I tell them sometimes, turn the lights down so I don't see all these mean faces. You ought to smile sometime. Can't be singing in the choir, the Lord will make a way somehow. <laughs> I'd be like, don't make that way for me. <laughs> Look at the person beside you, tell them, smile! <laughs> As Christians, we should not be rude, disconnected, mean, and untouchable. But neither should we be gullible, fanatical, overbearing, and accommodating of foolishness. And in times like the ones we are living in, tell your neighbor, keep your lips to yourself. Go ahead. <laughs> A nod will do. <laughs> Nevertheless, Paul encourages the church towards unity to the point of telling them to mark the people that cause division and offenses he says always be able to identify the ones who always keep mess going I said friend used to call me and talk about everybody he talked about every pastor, this one, that one, this one, that one. He talked so much that cantankerous members from other people's churches would go down to his church to talk to him about their pastor. They cut up talking, but I always knew in the back of my head that one day I'm gonna be the one he talking about. And sure enough, it happened because some people have no respect the person for who they talk about, they just backbite us. Paul knew that the greatest threat to the church at Rome and any church that seeks to be faithful to the principles of faith and fellowship in Christ is divisiveness. And in every church, there are people who are just downright offensive and have no respect for boundaries. And then there 
don't have a nerve to make it your fault and make you feel like you're less than a Christian when they don't when you don't allow them to cast all of their mess on you. No. You got to realize that you have a responsibility to be respectful of who and where people are before you overwhelm them with your unhealed and unbridled issues. Simply put, knock on my door before you walk in. Preach Dante. And we must also recognize that in every church, there are people who come from different social locations different family structures and upbringings. People come from different economic status, educational attainments, political affiliations, life experiences, and even different religious traditions. But in God's church, there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And every church has one pastor who is the set man or woman of the house who leads and feeds the church through the word of God in the doctrines of the faith as inspired, interpreted, and intended by God. Look at your neighbor and tell them you ain't the pastor. Oh, they don't like that. <laughs> but, as in everything, people have their own personal opinions, dislikes, grievances, objections, and agendas. But Paul said, none of those things are superior to the doctrine of our faith that we've been taught. And when people start distracting you from the word of God to focus on their own personal pettiness Paul said avoid them for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. And contrary to what you want and who you like, we serve a God of order and obedience. Let me go ahead and drop it in here while you're mad. The church is not a Burger King. You can't just have it your way. Everybody can't just run to the mic and say what you want to say, no matter how good God has been to you. Everybody can't teach different doctrines on salvation, on ecclesiology, eschatology, pneumatology, gifts of the Spirit, and giving. Everybody can't be a pastor, preacher, teacher, deacon, trustee, and leader just because you want to or just because that's what you did at your last church. Everybody can't be the boss, the chief, the shot caller, and the HNIC just because that's what you do on your job or in the street. Now, in God's church, there is order and obedience. And when you are out of order, we will first try to pray for you and get you in order before God puts you in order. Paul says to them, I'm telling you this because your obedience has become known to everybody. Whew, went over y'all head. He said, mock the divisive people among you. Watch out for the offensive people among you because your obedience 
has become known to everybody. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm preaching this sermon because we need to know that as God sees our obedience individually and institutionally, so does the devil. And the devil knows that God's favor follows our faithfulness. I'm going to say it again. That when you've been faithful over a few things, God is setting you up for increase, for overflow, for supernatural abundance. And, and that's the reason why you're under attack. You're sitting here wondering, why am I catching hell? I go to church every Sunday. I give my offerings. I read my Bible. I pray my prayers. I stay out of folks' business. I stay out of messiness. I keep to myself. And it seems like every time I turn around, the devil is doing something else to steal my joy. Can I tell you, he doesn't mess with people he already has. He messes with people that are trying to do the right thing the right way. That's why he's trying to break up your house. That's why he's trying to drive you crazy. That's why it seems like you got more bills than you got money. Because you're under attack. Because of your obedience. I need to park here parenthetically. To tell you that ever since our church has been moving in the right direction to transform the church and the community into the kingdom of God, the devil has tried to do everything he can to discourage, divide, and defeat our church. My wife told me this week, she said, Dante, the devil knows that when we rebuild this community, we will be pulling down strongholds that the devil has set up for decades. Folks have been dying and living in neglect with drugs and alcohol and disease and poverty for more than 40 years. We've been watching these vacant lots and folk walking around like zombies for 40 years. And when you decide to tear the kingdom of the devil down and build the kingdom of God up, the devil ain't going to stand by and let you do it without a fight. My, my son texted me this week on a very difficult day for me. I cried with my head in my hand because something didn't work out. He prayed for me. He went in and he texted me a whole message. I said, Lord, you probably lead that boy to do something he really doesn't want to do. He said, Dad, for someone strong enough to produce a vision like the one you have has to also have the ability to withstand any type of disappointment or haze or obstacle thrown at them. And the only way the devil can defeat you is for him to make you defeat yourself. That just made me cry some more. Because he's been listening better than I've been preaching. Have I got a witness here? So God told me to tell y'all today, you got to have a made up mind. That you will not be divided, nor will you be defeated. And I need everybody in this room to shout, we will not be defeated. 
I know there are those of you who've been climbing up the rough side of the mountain. You've been trying to make it to that next level. But every now and then, the devil knocks you back three steps. It seems like when you get to the top, you get knocked back down to the bottom. And God has been telling you, don't quit, but try, try again. And you want to throw in the, the white flag of surrender. You want to give up. You want to throw in the towel. But I dare you to shout, we will not be defeated. Now, I did not say that we won't be attacked. You will be attacked. You will be abused. You will be misunderstood, misused, mistreated, disappointed, and delayed. But you will not be defeated. If you are consistent in your discernment. That's point number one. Be consistent in your discernment. In other words, don't be dumb. Look at the person beside you and tell them, don't be dumb. Verse 19, Paul said, your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good. Paul then had already made them aware that faithfulness to God attracts favor from God and foolishness from the devil. But you can't allow the foolishness of the devil to make you a fool like the devil. God sent me here to tell somebody that you have to trust your spiritual discernment to see demonic, deceitful, and divisive people in your life. Because if we're not careful, people will have us caught up in their drama, their disease, their depression, and their dysfunction. And let me go ahead and keep it real with y'all. Some stuff you don't even need to use your spiritual discernment to see. Some folks in your life, just look at their history. Look at their consistency. Look at the evidence of their lives and you will begin to see the pattern and the pathology of their ways and their actions. This is why employers want to see your employment history. They want to see, are you stable? Are you going to stay on this job or quit like you quit the last job? They want to see how many jobs you had in the last 10 months. Some of y'all done been at 20 places in the last 10 months talking about it was the boss's fault. The devil is a liar. That's why they look at your social media account. And some of y'all say, well, wait a minute. That's personal. You stupid. Social means public. And they want to make sure that the inevitable real you doesn't show up on their job. Because you can't be up front in the church doing this and stripping online. You can't be in Norma Jean's going down the pole and then come to the pulpit talking about the Lord will make a way. Oh, y'all quiet, because that's where y'all hang. I got you. Some stuff, you ought to keep it to yourself. Preach Dante. Everything ain't for everybody. You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566.
Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed our first spoken word. Now, I'm going to enjoy our interview again. I know this young man, uh, Gordon Jones, but I didn't know him as the author. First and foremost, how did you move from where I knew you as working in radio to becoming an, an author? Well, it was a transition eventually because of the things that's happened in life recently, you know, with the changes and problems and so on that I decided to go another route and go a way that will inspire people. And I know that writing an inspirational book is one of those ways. That's good. Now, for those who are with us this morning, the book is called uh, Quotes Are Us. Yes. Tell us about the book. Well, Lee, I know that you can relate to that. There's been quotes that you've heard that had an impact on your life. Yes. And whether it was from famous people or uh, People you know, like family, uh -huh. they had an impact on your life. And that's how it is with me. So I realized that in life in general, people need different things to help them cope with life, such yeah. as uh, education, inspiration, uh, information. So this is like a quick injection, inspiration injection. Yes, and some motivation in there as well. Yeah. Because we need all those things. So based on that, what have I experienced in life? I put together a book of my personal quotes to help give people those things. So these are your original quotes, not the quotes that you have encountered along the way in your course of life. Correct. They are my original quotes. Oh, great. Now, what are some of the topics that you talk about in your quotes? Well, I have quotes that have can inspire people in general with life in general, as well as those that, that are in the Christian faith. I have quotes to help them as well. So would you have a quote on hope or would you have quotes on happiness? Would you have quotes on joy? I mean, how does that, how does it, how does it all come together? Yeah, I have it all broken down. We have different topics, uh, kindness, love, positive thinking. And as far as the Christian faith, faith in general, hope, uh, we have peace, blessings. So now this is, a, it's a quick read because it's not su super thick and nowadays I find that's m most preferable for most people. <laughs> yes, they don't is. want real thick books that's going to take forever to consume or something that they can digest quick. Was that part of the uh, reasoning behind your planning? Exactly. And also people constantly need inspiration around. So whether they get it through quotes or other materials, it could inspire them. I might borrow some of your quotes. You know, I use quotes from time to time on the radio show. <laughs> so how can folks get a copy of your book? Well, they can go to Amazon.com, type in Quotes Are Us by Gordon B. Jones, or they can go to BarnesandNobles.com, type in the same so, thing. So when all is said and done, when the smoke clears, what is your prayer? What was the motivating factor behind your writing the book? And what is it that you would hope that the reader would gain from your book when all is said and done? What I hope that they will gain is just hope in general, because I realize that if people have hope, that they can cope. That will help them cope with okay. life. All right, hope and cope, okay. So are there any other offerings in the planning? Well, if things go well, this book will be available throughout the different public library systems. You're trying to get it in the library system? Yes, it's in the works now. Great, are you looking to follow up with any other publications? Well, there may be a quote, sir, us too. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, that's interesting, interesting. Uh, you know, I always ask everybody, you know, for you, uh, did, during the pandemic, uh, what was that a time uh, for you personally? Uh, what, what did that time mean for you? It was challenging because of the changes. You know, I am also a minister, you know, not only a personality, but I'm also a minister. Uh -huh and a motivational speaker uh -huh. and see what I realized that because of that pandemic, it really had an effect on the mental health of people. That's great. You, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, one of the things that I've, I've constantly echoed in the aftermath of the pandemic is that uh, we as a society, matter of fact, a global society, have been traumatized. Yes. And nobody's addressing the trauma on the backside of the pandemic evidenced by some of the extremes that we've seen, yes. not only in behavior, but also in, you know, uh, acts of violence mm -hmm. since we've come out of the pandemic. And I would, I would argue the point that uh, those are indications of the trauma that people have experienced from the pandemic that they yet to realize 
that they're dealing with. Yeah, exactly. It's like the pandemic magnified those issues. Yeah. And that's what this book is about. See, if people know how to deal with life, then that can help them yeah. deal with it in a way that will keep them from doing those negative actions that can harm others or themselves as well. That's great. That's great. You know, um, what, what, what do you see now that we've come out of the pandemic? What do you see over the horizon? Are you troubled? Are you encouraged? Uh, what do you see? What's your, what's your insight of what you see happening in the world as we're moving out of the pandemic or after we've moved out? Yeah, I still see hope because of my faith in Christ. And also, if people have the right mindset, if they have that right mindset, then they can move forward and go in a positive direction. What about the church? Since now I'm gonna talk to the minister, not the author. Okay. What is the challenge for the church coming out of the pandemic? The challenge for the church is to stay relevant, stay with the times as far as using social media, taking advantage of what's available to keep reaching out to the people because you have people of different ways. The way the pandemic worked, people in churches have used social media in ways they probably never even thought of using. Well, had to, was forced to. They were forced to, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So they could do that. That's one way I can say they could keep, you know, the ministry alive. That's and, good. And outreach to people. All right, so look, look, uh, we're going to have you come back with us. We got our second spoken word. And uh, of course, uh, reiterate how they can get a copy of your book. Okay, good to see you. That was good. You young too, man. Lee. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make our way to our next spoken word, Dr. Kenneth Robinson over at Dream Life Worship Center. Then we'll be back with our guest right here on Grace and Glory. Dream Life Worship Center in Randallstown, Maryland is an uplifting church here on Grace and Glory. The July series, Why Did I Get Married? Start Sunday. If you are single, married, or a divorcee, this series is just for you at 11 a.m. See you there. So then we go back to the purpose of the reason for self uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. People, when they hear self, they get scared. Oh, we talking about it's supposed to be about God. No, it's you, it's yourself, God in you. And if you don't know you, that's the worst thing you bring into a relationship is when you don't know you. And when you don't know you, you choose the wrong person all the time. Yes. Because you don't know what you need. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're young, all you know is what you want. Mm -hmm. And some of us got what we wanted. Yep. And then we didn't want it anymore. Because <laughs> we, we found out that they didn't fit. Mm -hmm. They were unsuitable. Absolutely. With the purpose. Mm -hmm. And again, I always like to say this when we do this every year, that it's not about people being villains in our lives. That's right. That's it's not about people being antagonists. It's not about people being horrible people. Some things sometimes don't work out simply because they were not a suitable partner for right. your life. Doesn't mean they're a bad person. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. I think that's that's the learning curve, something that we have to mature into to say, hey, you know, you you good, but you're just not good for me. Now, so you have to know your purpose. You should have an idea what your purpose is. Mm -hmm. Then there's the question of self-love. I know my purpose, but I really don't love who I am. I don't love my life. If you hate, you hate your life and you bring in somebody in the life you hate. Mm -hmm. A life you hate and Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So I can't love you right if I don't know how to, if I don't love me. So it becomes a toxic cycle. You know, like I'm trying to love you. I can't love you because I don't love me. If I don't love me, I can't love you. So it all begins with self-love, self-knowledge and self-love. Being uh, in a place where you accept yourself for who you are. Whether you're single or divorced, and this is very important for even divorcees because a lot of times when people have gone through a divorce and they still want love, mm -hmm. but they haven't properly evaluated what went wrong. Yeah. And it's always easy to blame the other person, mm -hmm. and maybe the other person just really wasn't the right fit. Yeah. Maybe you married them out of lust, out of anxiety, 
at a church pressure? I'm going to say that again. Because a lot of us get married because of church pressure. Mm. You know, I had a man come to me. I'll never forget when I was single and, and was, you know, I was single for a little while and get married to about 26, 27. Back then, that was a long time in church. Mm -hmm. And I was the best man for about seven different weddings. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sitting in the line saying, Lord, when is my turn? And the devil talks to you and says, something wrong with you. You, you know, to get you. And I'll never forget when that bishop came to me and said, Robinson, do you want a wife? I said, yeah, of course I want a wife. He said, are you looking? And he was implying that something was wrong with me. <laughs> but I was just trying to find, wanting somewhat suitable for my purpose. But he pushed, one of those pressures will push you in making decisions just to get married because the pressure is on. And because, just because they are a believer does not mean that they are suitable oh, for you. Oh, Jesus. Like, really? Okay, listen, I don't care if they speak in more tongues than men and angels. There is an entire life that we have to walk out together. So many practical things that are not spiritual at all. Okay, your credit score, your work ethic. How you treat your children, how you treat your mother, what are your family dynamics, what is your yes, childhood yes. trauma, okay? What comes up on your blood test? How do you handle problems? How do you handle problems? Is your family hollering at each other all the time? Yeah. You're bringing all that. You're yeah. bringing all of that in a relationship. Yeah. So it is important as a basis, look at my purpose still, that you do know what your passion is in your purpose. Mm -hmm. Because your passion is what, is what drives you. Yeah. It is your passion that manifests your dream. Mm -hmm. And every one of you have a passion. And when you connect with the passion that heaven has for your life, do you think and begin to manifest who you really are in life? So here it is, you have a passion for something that the person you're connected with not only doesn't really know your passion, but they're not even interested in your passion. And they don't understand it. They don't understand it. So what they don't understand is gonna frustrate you and, and possibly, I've lived through this, uh, hinder you from doing what you are called to do. Whether it's a passion in ministry, yeah. whether it's a passion in business. See, we're talking like you in the relationship because I believe that you should be working together. Yeah. Now, listen to me very carefully. You may have different professions, but the Bible says let them have dominion, mm -hmm. not him, them. Mm -hmm which means that when you come together in purpose in God's plan, yeah. he has something for the two of you to do. Because as you always sing, two are better, better than, than one. one. Yeah. Come on. Well, I don't even like what you do. I don't even want to have nothing to do with what you do. But, and that, creates a, that doesn't create the best of marriage. No, couples don't have to do everything together. No, we're not implying that. That's right. But there are some things that God has called us to do together. Yeah. And yes. that togetherness has to be, there has to be like-mindedness. There has to be a, the same level of understanding. And, and so, again, a church membership does not make one suitable for you. Although I believe that believers should marry believers. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. That they should marry believers. Well, and unfortunately... I'm going to speak for women. I mean, I don't know. I'm going to let you speak for men. Unfortunately, my conversation and my experiences with women is that they tend to find what they feel like are more eligible men outside of the church. When it comes to work ethic sure. or credit or pursuing life on a higher level. And I don't like to hear that. Right. I, like to, I like to hear that we have enough men in the kingdom for these sisters to get a good man. 
Well, you know, it, it really begins with who you are as a being. You, are, you, 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 you have a purpose. And your, if your purpose is spiritual, which simply means who you are created to do, mm -hmm. be, then that worship is a part of that purpose. It, it, that's where it begins. Mm -hmm. Because you begin to think the thoughts of God, you begin to act the ways of God. And if you have a person that really doesn't want to connect at all with the worship of God of the relation, then it is going to be a challenge. And not yeah. even just we're going to church, just a challenge with spirituality at large. Well, you know, the new, the trendy thing is that I'm spiritual. Let's make that clear. Yeah, I'm spiritual. That's a confusing thing too. Yes. When you say kingdom, you're talking about having a relationship with the Lord Jesus with Christ. With the Lord Jesus Christ. And not another God. Yes. Because there are different gods out here. Yeah. Little G. And philosophies of religion can tear a relationship up. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you somebody don't believe in prayer and you hooked up with a Muslim that prays seven times a day. Yeah. I like my mother and father. I'm going to just move off this purpose, but um, I have to use them because my father was, you know, he was saved out of prison. Mm -hmm. He was immediately called to preach. Mm -hmm. And and the scripture said it's not good for a man to be alone. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the first things they told him that you need to do is get a wife. And he was totally sold out the guy. He knew he was going to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And he married my mother, who was a PK woman. Mm -hmm. They were married 58 years mm -hmm. because the, their lives were centered around church. Mm -hmm. They had five children. They did other things, but their lives was entwined. I think about they went through many changes as a, as a, as a married couple, mm -hmm. but they were centered on their purpose. She knew this is my husband's purpose. Mm -hmm. So no matter what we, I got to be there suitable for him. Absolutely. You got to find the purpose, your purpose, their purpose, and see where it meshes together because purpose is more powerful than money. Mm -hmm. Purpose is more powerful than friendships. There is nothing more powerful in the earth than purpose. Mm -hmm. And we have found that a lot of times couples, as they grow older, and you always hear me say, the toughest time of marriage is not zero through five years. Sometimes the toughest time is between the years of 10 through 25 or 15 and 20. Why? Because people have grown apart mm -hmm. because they don't know their purpose. Mm -hmm. So purpose is important. How do people grow apart? What kind of ways do people grow apart? I think not taking interest in each other's life. Mm -hmm. You know, again, there are things that you like that I ain't really that excited about. Yes, and likewise. And likewise, right? Mm -hmm. You see how she said that quickly? <laughs> But because we're together, and that goes to number two. Let's jump right into that. Priority. Okay. Priority. Purpose For this and priority. Purpose and priority. Are you willing to make that person a priority? Mm -hmm. Can they be a priority? Mm -hmm. For this purpose shall a man leave his mother and father. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some people, guys, I know in particular, that are still into their mother and father. They still live in their mother and father's house. Well... They haven't left yet. And cleave unto your wife. Mm -hmm. uh, y'all know I ain't scared of none of y'all, so I'm going to say. <laughs> the point is, when you get in a relationship, you have to make a decision that that person is my priority. And that shows up early. Oh, God. That is demonstrated early. I mean, in, even in the early interest stages. And in dating. In dating. dating. Because you, you, if you're interested, you're going to make even your interest in that person a priority. Okay, so that means everything can't be tech. You, you gonna have to call me. Seven 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 ninety three eleven. Or take me out sometime, right? Yes. So those, those tendencies show up early. You got, how bad do you want me? How important is it, the per you pursuing a person, how important is it that they know, hey, I'm interested. I want to get to know you better. 
Okay, I don't care if we have to meet at the Starbucks for just 15 minutes. I want to see you this week. Those things show up early, and if you ignore those things, if those things are not in place, you will regret them later on. And we're talking even when you become exclusive, you know, as you're talking about you're exclusively for each other now, okay, because that's we'll deal with that next week. Mm -hmm. The next week we're going to talk about situationships. Mm -hmm. What's really going on? Mm -hmm. What is this? Mm -hmm. If you decided this is going to be exclusively my woman or my whatever, and you still waiting on the phone call yeah. every week. No. That means whatever is going on in his life, you ain't going to be important. Because he's not going to turn that on once you get a certificate. Right. And here's the caveat is that oftentimes we accept these behaviors because we're lonely. You know, we accept these, these, this, this kind of thing because we don't want to stick. We, we want companionship. That's absolutely understandable. But here is what's more important is that we ask God to fill every space in us yes. that is vulnerable so that I don't give in to something and settle for something that is less than what God has for me. Do I fit in your schedule? Yeah. And this is something that, this, that, that we need to discover in dating, but it's something that we have to watch even after we get hooked up. Yeah, yeah. Because what seems to happen is my profession, my, my family, my family mm -hmm. uh, even the church. My friends, yeah. My friends. And the church. And the church also can take the place of this person that I said I'm committed to for life, and you're trying to figure out why there's no chemistry, the vibe ain't like it used to. Well, because you didn't make that person a priority. They was at one point, but they're no longer a priority. Yeah. And I, we have to pay it, attention it, to those things. They got to be more important than your mama. Yeah. This is another good thing. This is also a good message for those of you that have blended families. One of the biggest challenges we face when we talk to people who have blended families is who is the, who is the priority now? You married me, I got kids, I got a, a whole other side of family you might haven't even met yet. Mm -hmm. But since you said I'm gonna be your number one, who's a priority? And I have literally been in the presence of, and this starts with women as well as men, but I've been in the presence of women who will, will say, listen, I may be mad at you, but that's my kids. Something's wrong. That doesn't, that does, that doesn't mean you ignore, because if you want to get close to a woman, you get close to her kids. Yeah, you better but say if, that again. If, if you want to get close to a woman, you better love her kids. Or find a way to love them. <laughs> All the men say right, amen. It's like the package deal. Yeah, it is. When, but but, when but the, sometimes it's a struggle. When the children are making, minor, making minor my, children. It's a different year. But I'm just talking about the struggle of really making that person a priority. you got to ask that question when you, once you got married. When you get married. Mm-hmm. What's, what's, what, who's, you, I know what it comes down to me. And there's no thing and no one in the earth more important than her. Mm -hmm. I will not even dream life. I will stop everything. What's wrong? You ain't feeling good? You don't like that? This Amen. ain't going right? Yeah. I'm going to find out. And I ain't mm -hmm. punking out either. This is my wife. Amen. Likewise. I've made her a priority. priority. Now, I've made a priority because, of course, that's the man. That's what it means, the love. I'm the first one to make you a priority, but you also make me a priority. Absolutely, yes. So is it, so is and it I've even threatened to, to fight people over you, man. <laughs> she sure has. I, I have. I have said I don't want to have to, but I will. If Mr. Matt Ferguson come all out of her. Ferguson, Missouri, baby. But that's a good feeling. And the reason why I'm saying this, because we talk to many couples and many people in relationship who don't have that security. Yeah. I don't really know if you really have my back. And, and again, I keep saying this, this, these kind of things show up early on. Early on, in the interest dating courtship stages, these kind of opportunities present themselves. 
And if I if I if I have a blowout on the side of the road, and we court courting, bruh. When you call your daddy, no, I ain't calling my daddy. Not at that season in my life. You know, those kind of things show up early. And it's not to say that somebody has to come into your life and just drop everything all the time for you. There's some balance in that, but there sh definitely should be an interest. There should be a sense of, hey, you know what? I, I, need, to, <laughs> I need to get to her rescue. Come on, somebody. That's right. Got to make them a priority. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're in relationship with someone right now, just look at your spouse and say, you are my priority. You are my priority. So some of y'all could, for some to regain their trust and faith in a God who's able to give them love again. For some to say, you know what, I got to let this unforgiveness go. For some to say, you know, the problem that's in our relationship is that we're not pursuing God together. You're going in one direction, I'm going in another. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, I hope that there's something that you have heard or we said today that will cause you to repent. And repent don't mean just run and cry, but it means make up your mind by God's grace and the conviction of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Thanks for joining Dream Life Worship Center here on Grace and Glory. Also, you have time to join us online or in person. Visit dreamlifewc.com. We would love to see you at the Dream. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the program today. I must confess I've enjoyed getting a chance to uh, recollect and uh, rekindle thoughts with uh, former co-worker Gordon Jones, uh, Minister Gordon Jones, author Gordon Jones. Yes. Uh, before you leave, uh, any parting thoughts uh, that you would like to share with the audience? Well, I want to continue to spread this message of positivity. So if those who want to reach out to me, I can tell more about my book and share it with you. They can reach me at blessedandtalented at hotmail.com. All right. Uh, what about your other social media? You have social media? Yes, I have Instagram, Blessed and Talented Soul Ministries, and also Facebook, Blessed and Talented Soul Ministries. They can reach me there. And if they want a copy of the book, again, go to Amazon.com or BarnesandNobles.com and type in Quotes Are Us by Gordon B. Jones. All right. Don't forget the B, Gordon B. Jones. Yep, well, listen, B. it is a pleasure to see you. Thank you and man. so encouraging to see that you're continuing in that vein of doing positive work in the community. Young man, uh, we encourage and we celebrate you here. Thank you. All right. And we celebrate you for being with us this morning. Hope you've enjoyed the program. Hopefully we've lit a fire, maybe set a spark in place to get you fired up, make your way to the temple, wherever the temple might be today. And if you don't have one, let me just put in a shameless plug and say, join us over at Manifest Wonders Christian Center, 3600 Edmondson Avenue, uh, where our doors swing on welcome hinges. Till next week, continue to walk in His grace and live in His glory. We look forward to making the connect right here on WMAR-TV2 with grace and glory.
getting around isn't as easy as it used to be. That's why we call Bath Fitter. They removed our old tub and installed a beautiful new spacious shower. Now, getting in and out is a breeze. And we have peace of mind with seamless walls that provide a watertight fit, plus their lifetime guarantee. Thanks to Bath Fitter, life is so much easier with a shower we love. Don't wait. Call right now and pay no interest for 24 months. Find out why Bath Fitter is the perfect fit. Nurtec is the only medication that can treat and prevent my migraine attacks all in one. Don't take if allergic to Nurtec. Allergic reactions can occur even days after using. Most common side effects were nausea, indigestion, and stomach pain. Talk to your... Watching w